Hello everybody and here we are again and now a test num that's numbered 13 contains maths and English and well done for sticking it out this long. This is your second last test or the word that came up in uh, the last test that I went over. This is your penultimate test that uh, we're going to be putting on online for you. So good luck. Number one, a table and five chairs cost £520. If the table costs 120, what is the cost of each chair? There's various calculations in that. First of all, we have to take away uh, the cost of the table from the whole total. So uh, you'll have 520 pounds, subtract your 120. And hopefully you'll have been writing this down on your working out sheet. <clears throat> and if you do the subtraction, you find that we're left with £400 and that's the cost of five chairs. So now we have to divide that by five. Five into 40 goes eight times and five into naught goes naught. So one chair is £80. The following number line includes a decimal point or a decimal part, sorry. So we're going from 4.5, 4.6, 4.7, 4.8, 4.9. So in between each of these temps, we're divided up even further. And you have to say, what is the number that's marked A and the number that's marked B? So A, if you look, it's exactly halfway between 4.5 and 4.6. So halfway between that would be 4.55. So that's halfway, five hundredths. Remember, that's units, tenths, hundredths. And... Uh, point B is pointing to, well, if you look, it's halfway before between 4.8 and 4.9. If you can work out each of these little gaps is worth 2 point, um, sorry, not point uh, 0.25. So it'll be uh, up to here is not point uh, 0.75. So we've got not point 0.8, not point 0.85 not add on another uh, not not two five, so we end up with uh, oh gosh 4.875 because it's 4.8 and then it's not point not seven five not not point not two five not point five not point not seven five so we end up with not point eight seven five. Right, on we go. Number four. On this scale, it represents 60 metres. So that amount represents 60 metres. So that goes from naught to 60. And each little gap you can work out is worth 15. 15, 30, 45. So each little bit, 15 in each of those. So you have to see how much does this turn out to be. In terms of if we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 15 times 7. 35, 7, 7 is 10. So it turns out to be 105 metres. Because you worked out how much you have to work out what one little gap is worth. And then now in this one you've got 7 of those. Each digit of a number has a value. Fill in the missing values in these <coughs> questions. So we've got 62.7, six tenths, two units, seven tenths. There we go. So you have to write in there tenths, T E N T H S. Right? Make sure you know the difference between tenths and tens because the value is a lot different. 3.49. So we've got three units, and then that's 49. Now it's not 49 tenths, it's 49 hundredths. And that's 49 hundredths. And the last one on this page. A large bag of sweets weighs 25 kilograms, and these are to be divided into packets containing 400 grams. So how many packets can be filled from the 25 kilogram bag? And that's sort of a lot, it's like long division. You are to see how many 400s can fit into 25 kilograms. But you have to be able to make them 
the same measurement. So if you s changed your kilograms into grams, so it matched up with this one. So we'd end up with, um, you know there's a thousand grams in the kilogram, so we have to turn that into thousands. And then we have to divide that by the 400. If you set it out like that, sometimes it's easier to see. Now, and we can simplify it a bit. Divide that by 100 to start with and divide that by 100. And you're left with 25, is that right, 25,000 divided by 4. So you've got 4 in the, t if you want to make it out, 4 into 25 goes 6 times. And one, wasn't it, um, one left over. Four into ten goes two times, remainder two. But the question is that you can't have remainder two. This is how many packets can be filled. So we can fill 62 full packets. And then there'll be a few sweets left over. Okay, we're on to page two. And we start with the graph. And my tip of the graph is if you've got a bar graph, before you do anything, write the number at the top uh, of each bar and then it's quick then to do your calculations afterwards. So number of cards, number of children. Between 0 and 9 there was 4, 10 to 19 there was 10, 20 to 29 that was 7, 30 to 39 was 5 of them, 40 to 49 was 2, there was none in there and 60 or more there was 3. Now let's look at the questions. How many pupils collected 30 cards or more? So we're going from here up. So we had 5 and 2, 7 and 3 is 10. How many pupils collected cards all together? Collected the cards, you have to add them all up. 4 and 10 is 14, 7 is 21, 5 is 26, 28 and 3 makes 31. And finally, how many pupils collected less than 30? So it's from here down. 7 and 10 17 and 4 is 21. And again, if you have it like that, if you have time at the end, that's easy then for checking. And you can also double check that you've got those right, you've counted those bars correctly. And below are the first three patterns in a, draw, a series. So we've got one black shaded to white. And then we've got the original, one shaded, two white, and then two shaded added in. Then we take that origin, that pattern, move it over, and then add on two white ones. And then the next one would have two shaded ones, and the next one would have two white ones added on each time. So how many squares are there in the fourth pattern? So we have one, two, three, four. In the fourth pattern, how many shaded squares? Well, we know in the next one we're getting, uh, they're adding on the shaded ones. So if you counted those, one, two, three, four, five, there will be five. And how many white squares um, were in the will be in the fourth pattern? There will be the same number because we, we use this one and then we just add all the shaded ones. So there will be the same number of four white ones in that. And look, it says there, you may make a drawing to help you with your answer. That's very valuable. You can draw that one out again, you know, and make up all your too many. One, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three. Isn't that right? Shaded, white, shaded, white, shaded, white, shaded, white, shaded. And that will help you with your counting. So feel free to draw. Even if it doesn't say you can draw, Go ahead and draw it yourself on your working out page. Page three now. The photocopying's not great in this, but we, we can manage. How many 17 pence sweet bars could you buy for four pounds? And what change would you have? Right, let's see. We would have, what change would you get? So we have to see how many 17s can you fit into four pounds? Again, look, this is pence, this is pounds, so you're best to change the two of them into the same money. So we'll make the four pounds, 400 pence. 
and divide that by 17. And you're thinking, I can't do long division, but you don't really need to. Just think how many 17s will go into 40. And you should be able to work that out. You'll know you get two in. Two 17s make 34. So if you've made 34, that means you have a remainder of six. So carry that over. And the many times 17 go into 60. 17 will go into 60 three times with a remainder of nine. So we now have worked out we'll be able to get 23 bars and there will be 9p change. In a bag there are 10 black balls, 10 white balls and you pick out a ball at random then you return the ball to the bag. This is done 20 times. 10 times you pick the black ball and 10 times you pick the white ball. You then repeat this picking a ball at random and returning it and this is done 20 times. A number of statements are written below and we have to take those that are true. This is a probability question. Let's see, out of these 20 balls that are in the bag, you are certain to pick a black ball 10 times. No, you're not. You could pick a black ball once. You might never pick a black ball. It's totally random. It may be possible to pick a white ball 10 times. It may be possible. It's not saying it's a definite. It's saying it is possible and that could happen. The black ball will never be picked. That's not true. That can't be true. You don't know it'll never be picked. It may never be picked. But you can't say that it definitely will not. The black ball could come out 15 times and the white ball 5 times. That is a possibility. And the white ball will come out at least once. Again, it may not. There's a chance it might never come out. Out of the 20 balls, you could keep picking a black one every single time. So it's only those two that are correct. Now... Let's look. If 46 times 2.7 is 124.2, what would 23 times 2.7 be? So if you look, 23 is half of 46. So your answer has to be half of this answer. So 124.2 half divided by 2, 2 into 12 goes 6, 2 into 4 goes twice, and 2 into point goes once. So you don't need to be able to do that calculation. You just need to be able to see the relationship between this sum and this sum. And that's quite a, t um, a typical question that comes up. If you know this is half of this, so you're looking for half the amount of 2.7s. So you just half your answer. And um, this is one of a fairly typical questions about equivalent fractions. Which of the following fractions is the same as two-fifths? If we can get them all, can we get these all down into fifths? To get that to fifths, we need to divide by four, and we can't divide that by four. We need to divide that by six. We can't divide that by six. We can't get that to fifths. We can't get that to fifths. To get that to fifths, we divide by four. So we have to divide that by four. Oh, look, and there it is. That looks familiar. But... If you find the answer before you get to the end of all the possibilities, keep going, do them all, just to be sure that this one. If we make that into fifths, we divide it by five, so we have to divide that by five, and that ends up as three fifths. So it's only that's the only one there that could be two fifths. And one of the following is equivalent to nine twenty-fourths. Nine tw it's, you need to be able to know what that looks like as a fraction. 9 twenty-fourths. That's what it looks like. So we have to find one of these that is the same as 9 twenty-fourths and you have to go through them all. To make that, we have to multiply it by 3 to make it into 9. So we multiply that by 3 and that gives us 12. Uh, we can't make that into twenty-fourths and we can't make that into 9. So that's out. We can't make that into twenty-fourths and we can't make that into a 9. Now, I can make that into 24ths. 
3 eighths, so I multiply that by 3, it gives me 24, so I multiply that by 3, 3 is our 9. That gives me 9 24 but I'm still going to do the others as well. I'd need to multiply that by 8 to make it 24 so I have to multiply that by 8, so that's not the same. I have to double that, multiply that by 2 to make it 24, so then it means uh, multiply that by 2. So really there's only one there and it was your 3 eighths. And that's important as well, look, it, it's a tip that says circle your answer. So you have to circle it. If you put a tick beside it, there's a good chance they won't mark it. Or if you underline it, there's a chance. If it says circle your answer, you clearly put a circle around your answer. Okay, moving on, we have to write true or false after each of the following. And again, look, read, this is another tip. It doesn't say write T or F. It says write true or false. So put the whole word, word in. Don't be given any excuse for somebody not to be able to mark your question right just because you haven't followed the instructions. So is it true or false? A rectangle 10 centimetres long and 9 has an area of 80. Well, hopefully you'll know how to find the area of a rectangle. Let's say it was this rectangle. 10 by 9. To find the area, you multiply the length by the width. 10 times 9 is 90. So that's not. So that one is definitely false. That statement. A square of perimeter of 28 has an area of 49. Let's say we know a square, every side is the same length. We know perimeter is the distance around the outside. So this distance is around here is 28. So four, four, by four watts make 28. So I know that's seven, seven. Four, seven. So every side is seven. Now, if that's the perimeter, then I can use that to work out the area. To find the area, it's set the length by the width. Seven by seven is 49. So that is true. And an equilateral triangle of sides eight centimeters has a perimeter of 24. Equilateral, all sides are the same length. So 8, 8 and 8 is 24, that is true. A regular hexagon with sides of length 5 centimetres has a perimeter of 30. A hexagon, you know, is a six-sided sided shape. And if each set of those six is 5 centimetres, 6 fives is 30. So that's the distance all around the outside of the hexagon is 30 centimetres. So that one is also true. To do that question, you need to know the properties of rectangles. You need to know when a hexagon has six sides. You need to know an equilateral triangle. The sides are all equal length. You need to be able to find perimeter and you need to be able to find area as well. There's lots of things about shapes that you need to know to be able to do that question. Or those questions, because there was one mark each. And number 23. Below are designs for templates for painting room borders. Put a tick in the box under the two designs that would look the same upside down. Remember the word two is written in bold. So pay attention, you have to have two ticks. And the ones that would look the same upside down, if you flipped it from here and ups turned it upside down, that one's going to look the same upside down and that one's going to look the same upside down those are the only two now there are 154 pupils in a school and three sevenths of them are girls so how many are boys well if three sevenths are girls that means four sevenths are boys because you add them together that gives you seven sevenths four sevenths are boys so we have to find out how many pupils make one seventh so you have to divide 154 by 7. 7 into 15 goes 2, remainder 1. 7 into 14 goes twice. 1 seventh is 22. So 4 sevenths multiplied 22 by 4 would give you 88 of them were boys. And number 25, what is the cost of 1.5 litres of paint at 3.70 3 a litre? So I've got a litre and a half. So I need to know, I need to have 
That's one liter. And if I have to find out what is half of that, I hope you're working these out. Half your three pounds seventy. Two and that goes once and one over. Two into seventeen goes eight and one over and two into ten goes five. Mm -hmm. So half a liter equals one pound eighty five. So I have three pounds seventy plus the half which is one eighty five. Add those together. Five is fifteen. Is when you add them together you get five pounds fifty five. For the liter and a half. Question number 26. How many glasses holding 250 milliliters can be filled from a 1.5 liter carton of milk? Well, again, look, we've got different measurements. You can change your liter into 1,500 milliliters, and all you have to work out is how many 250s fit into 1,500. It's not that hard. It's a. If you wanted to do it as dividing, it would be a big dividing sum. Mm. But um, 200, 250 mils, if you have two of those, you get, um, that equals one glass. 500 mils, that's two glasses. So if you double that, if you had a thousand mils, that would be four glasses. And to make up, look, you, there you have made up your 1,500 millilitres, your one and a half litres, with two glasses and four glasses. So all together, it makes six glasses. It's really looking at the numbers, knowing the relationship between 250 and 1,000. How many 250s fit into 1,000? Then how many fit into half of 1,000? And it's been able to see that connection. And number 27. Curb stones are 80 centimetres long. How many curb stones are needed for a path which is 24 metres long? Again, our measurements are different. How many 80s will fit into 24? How many 80 centimetres will fit into, uh, well, we'll change this into centimetres. That's 24 metres, and we know there's 100 centimetres in a metre, so we multiply that by 100. And then we can divide it by 80. Now, to make it a wee bit simpler, we can divide that by 10 and divide that by 10. Even them out. And then you're just dividing 8 into 240. 8 goes into 24. 3 times 8 into naught goes naught. So 30 of those curb stones will fit into your 24 metres. I know if you're having trouble seeing that, maybe that's something you could look up on your... Uh, PMP books, or maybe try to go back to Corbett Maths and look up some questions on um, meters, centimeters using measurements or uh, just solving problems using measurements. That would be good practice because these can be quite tricky. Number 28. There are between 40 and 50 members in a youth club. When they're put into teams of seven, there are no members left out. And when they are in teams of six, there's one member left out. How many members are in the youth club? This was strategy to do this would be guess, check and improve. Really knowing six and seven times tables, dividing by six, dividing by seven, and working around the numbers 40 and 50. So you know, um, when they're in teams of seven, there's none left out. So think an answer to your seven times tables that comes between 40 and 50. And I know six times seven is 42. Seven times seven is 49. So it could possibly be those. It could maybe be 42 in the youth club or 49. Let's see if this one works out. When they're in teams of six, one member is left out. Okie doke. So think of your six times tables. Um that come between 40 and 50 answers to the six times tables. Um, and when they're multiplied by six, or when they're put in teams of six, one member's left out. So six sevens is 42, six eights is 48. And that would work then, look. Teams of seven, none are left out. You've got exactly 49. When they're in teams of six, 
with 48, then one would be left over. So we know then that there must be 49 members in the youth club. And that's when you can go back afterwards and see, um, does your answer fit in with these statements? And number 29, I get a similar one of these questions. If 600 times 200 is 120,000, what's the answer to 6,000 times 200? So if you look at the connect connection between this number is 10 times bigger than this number. So you have to have an extra knot on your answer. Take the same answer and add another knot on. And then number 30 and 31. That's telling us um, two marks. So on the plan of a patio, each paving slab is six millimetre squares. The actual size of a real slab is 18 centimetre squares. This is like, a, this is a scale. Uh, a, uh, it's about scale. So what is a scale? So they're telling us the scale is six millimetres on the plan equals the same as 18 centimetres in real life. Can we work out the relationship then between millimetres and centimetres? You know there's 10 millimetres in a centimetre, so this is going to be 10 times bigger. So when we change that into millimetres, so 6 millimetres on the plan is the same as 180 millimetres in real life. And we can divide 6 into 180, and that'll tell us how many of those 6 into 18 goes 3, 6 not goes not. So one millimetre would be the same as 30 millimetres. But it's telling us here we have to change this 30 millimetres back into centimetres. So when um, the scale is one centimetre represents, um, on the plan, represents uh, 30 centimetres in real life. See, it looks a wee bit blurry, but hopefully we'll make it out. I'll try and fix it in the next page. One fifth of Anne's savings amount to £3.60. So how much has she saved? So a fifth of something. Something divided by five is £3.60. So to work backwards, you take her £3.60 and multiply it by five. Those are not five, six or thirty. Five or fifteen is eighteen. And put your decimal point in. So she has saved up eighteen pounds so far. Number 33. In a school race, three pupils, Lisa, Dick and Frank, were three of the runners. And Lisa ran 150 metres in 24 seconds. Dick ran 600 metres in 84 seconds. And Frank ran 300 metres in 40 seconds. So which three ran the fastest? I thought a way to look at this would be to try and break these down a wee bit. Try and, the number of seconds, try and get them... Um, evened out a wee bit so we could break down the ratio between the metres and the seconds. So think of something you can divide 24 by and also 150. So if we divided the both of them by three, just bring them down by a third. So 150 divided by three would be 50. So she ran 50 metres and divide that by three, you get eight, 50 metres in eight seconds. Can I bring these, can I get this down nearly to... Um, Eight or find something you can divide both of these by and divide them both by 12. So 60 divided by 12 is 50 meters, and 84 divided by 12 is 7. So he ran 50 meters in 7 seconds. Let's see, can I get this one down to 50 meters as well, or can I get it down? Mm, let me see break both those down and we'll bite 10 could she do 30 meters in four seconds well that's frank did 30 meters in four seconds it might be easier to compare them well look if he's doing 30 meters in four seconds he took longer to run 50 meters so you can clearly see which of the three ran the fastest frank clearly ran the fastest when you can bring it down like that so you have to put frank's name in there which of them ran the slowest? Well, it's down between these two now, and they, we've got them down to the same distance. So who took the longest to do it? Well, that was Lisa. She took eight seconds to run her 
50 meters, uh, whereas Dick ran his 50 meters in seven seconds. In a sale, all goods are reduced by 20%. So how much do I pay for a board game? That 20%, you have to know that's the same as a fifth. The fraction that goes with 20% is a fifth. And to find a fifth, you divide by five. That's a nice straightforward one. So how much would I pay for a board game which normally cost 18 pounds? So we have to take our 18 pounds, divide it by five. Five and 18 goes three, and three over. Five into 30 goes six. So there's three pounds 60 coming off your 18 pounds. So you have another calculation to do now. 18 pounds take away 360. So nothing. 10 take away six is four. So it looks like £14.40 is the new price of the board game. How much would I save on a cuddly toy which was priced at £30? So again, a fifth of £30. 20% of £30. So it's 30 divided by 5 and that is 6. So you're going to save £6. The exact ages of four children are as follows. John was 7 years 5 months. Mary is 7 years 11, Harry is 8 years 1 month, Anne is 7 years 7 months. What is the average age of these children in years and months? You can do it um, so that um, everybody's, you can add up your years and months separately. We can have 7 and 5, 7 and 11. 8 and 1 and 7 and 7. We can take them as two separate months on this side and years on this side. So we have 5 and 11 is 16, 1 is 17 and another one is 24. So we have 24 months and then we're going to add up the years. This is months and this is years. Add up all their years. 3 sevens are 21, add 8 makes 29. And then you can divide that by four. Or you can put them all together. Look, you know this 24 months is the same as two years, so you can add that on. But to do this, I'm going to keep it separate as years and months. So we had 29 years, divide that by four, and 24 months. So divide that by four. Now four goes into that seven times and will a remainder of one year. A remainder of one year. 24, well, that one year, if you turn that into months to bring it over to here, that because another 12 months. So altogether, you've now got 36 months. This one is a bit complicated. So you have to divide your 36 months by, sorry, by four. And I know that four nines make 36. So in total, uh, it turned out to be seven years, I'll write that in over here for you, there was seven years and nine months. And now what fraction of this circle is hatched? Now they say hatched, it just means these lines drawn in it. It'll probably, it means, it also means shaded. What fraction? So count how many little bits there are all together. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight parts all together and one, two, three of them are hatched or shaded. So three eighths shaded in. And now you have to shade 40% of this shade, this shape. 40% is 40 over 100. Four tenths, just keep simplifying it two-fifths and then that makes it easy because you've got one, two, three, four, five bits so it's already divided into fifths so you have to shade two and any two parts would get you the mark for that one. Now we have to read the passage and answer the questions. I'm going to read through it with you. Please follow it. Um, this wasn't a very difficult piece. There wasn't a lot of difficult words or vocabulary in it. Uh, so hopefully you wouldn't have found it too difficult. My earliest memory was when my parents, my brother and I were going to the seaside. We had invited our two cousins to go with us. At that time I was four and my brother was five. 
We were very excited as it was our first visit to the sea. When we got there, the roaring of the waves made us afraid and there was such a large crowd of people. When we got down to the beach, we started to build sandcastles. Mummy asked my cousins if they would like to go down to the sea. They agreed, so I went down with them. At first, I was terrified of the waves. I wanted to run back up to Daddy, but Mummy caught me by and made me jump over them. I thought they were going to come they were coming to get me, but after a while I realised that they were just they just went through me. I started to enjoy myself and then had good fun. Now, how many others besides the author went to the seaside? Well he talks about his parents, so that's two, his brother, that's one, and two cousins. So altogether that gives five people. What word describes the waves? And it says we got the roaring of the waves. And what did they first do on the beach? The first thing they did, um, when we got down to the beach, we started to build sandcastles. So they built, you're gonna build sandcastles, make sandcastles, as long as you've got the word sandcastles in there. And what was the author's emotion when she first went into the sea? Emotion would be her feeling. It says, at first I was terrified. So that was her emotion. You could say she, her emotion was terror or she felt fear. Anything, I suppose any word that describes, any adjective that describes her feeling scared. You could also be scared. There. How did the mother get the author to play in the waves. And it says, mummy caught me and made me jump over them. So she um, caught, caught her and they jumped over the waves. Again, something along those lines. And they jumped over the waves. And then numbers six and seven, the words going and started are verbs. Turk circle two verbs. So to do this, you need to know what type of word verbs are. They're doing words, actions. Normally actions you can see, but sometimes they're a bit abstract and they're actions that you can't see, but let's see. The seaside is not something you do. Caught, that is something you do. I'm gonna put a dot beside it and check, but check them all out. Crowd, that's a thing. Myself, again, that's a thing. I realised, again, that's something you do. You can't really see anybody realising, but it is something that's happening, something they're doing. And the word they. So it's not a verb. That says circle the two words. So I have to put a circle around that and a circle around that. And number eight, circle the word from the list below which best describes the children's emotions before they arrived. So when they were traveling in the car, they were quite excited. It tells us up here, we were very excited. So which one there is the closest to being excited? And there it is, excitement. I have always had the clearest memory of my first day at school at the age of four. I don't know why, but maybe it was the first important step in my life. The teacher's face had a huge smile as she welcomed me to school. It seemed I was entering a new world. I remember the way the children gazed and stared at me. There were lots of new faces, some threatening also. I wondered if I would ever find a friend. In a matter of seconds, I was introduced and put into a class in which there was nobody I knew. Everyone was chatting. I seemed to be the odd one out. I felt like a stranger, but then maybe I was one. Then suddenly I saw a small girl looking very sad. I felt she was in a similar dilemma to me. So I forced myself to say, hello. I did, and we began to talk. It seemed as if I had broken down the barrier between myself and all those strange faces. The writer felt that when everyone was chattering, she was part of it, or she wasn't part of it, or she didn't care. Now look, this is in bold, and it's underlined, and it says, underline the correct answer. So we're not circling, were underlining and the writer felt she wasn't part of it. The word gazed in the passage means gaze 
That means when you're looking at something, you're watching intently. And again, underline it. Watched intently. Number 11. Describe the teacher's face as the author was welcomed to school. And it said, um, the, the teacher's face had a huge smile. So her face was smiling. In the first line of the passage, which adjective describes the author's memory? So we're only looking at the first line and we're looking for an adjective. There is the clearest. The clearest memory. And what type of a word or part of speech is introduced? That's again, that's something you're doing. The teacher would introduce you. So it's a verb. I've written out the punctuation for you. So it is what happened? Question mark. And that's surrounded by speech marks. Hannah asked. Capital H for Hannah. Then we start the speech marks again. And you have to have a capital A. As I... And a capital I. As I lifted the lid, the cat jumped out. Full stop. Finish off your uh, speech marks. So you need all of those in. And that is three marks. Three marks for all of that. So that would be a mark for your speech marks. There and there. Um, a mark for your additional punctuation. Your question mark to go in there. Your full stop there. And then... A mark for capital letter for Hannah and the I in there to know that. Oh yes, and I missed a bit out. Emma told her. And e, capital E for Emma would have to be in along with your capital letters for names to get in the mark for that. And on we go. Rewrite the following sentence, correcting the error in each sentence. The bus went past the supermarket. Sounds okay when you say it, but the spelling there, and it was um, past. James and Anne is cousins. Well, it be James and Anne are cousins. John has wrote a letter to Mary. So John has written a letter to Mary. Rita, Harry and me are friends. You would have to say Rita, Harry and I our friends. Now another passage to read and this is a poem. When I come home from school at night and hope to do my homework right, I often wonder what I'll be when I grow up. I can't wait to see. I think I would like to be an athlete and achieve a difficult feat. I would like to be the best on the go, like Eamon Coughlin or Sebastian Coe. I think of the Olympics every four years and when I'd win I'd burst into tears. At the start of the Olympics, the torch is lit. I'd be so excited, I could hardly sit. I would like to go and break records too, but never take drugs like others do. There's running and jumping and plenty more, but after the training, I'd be very sore. And while I'm sitting in a world of my own, I'm remembered by mother that I'm sitting at home. I look at my books and my homework's not done. So then I discovered no medals I've won. And the questions. Two athletes are named in the poem and who are they? And they're up there, Eamon Coughlin and Sebastian Coe. They were great runners back in the day. So you have to write their names in. And you have to spell them correctly. You're copying from the passage down here, so your spelling has to be right. And now, the poet wrote that when he won at the Olympics, He'd burst into tears, he'd jump for joy, he'd ring his mammy. And we have to underline the answer. Well, the passage tells us that he would burst into tears. I'd burst into tears. So you underline that one. And when the poet looked at books, what was discovered? Well, he'd looked, it's back in this last verse. My homework's not done. I look at my books and my homework is not done. Homework not done. Anything that indicates that he didn't get his homework done. 
And the poem tells us how the Olympics take place, how often the Olympics take place, how often do they take place. And it's, I think of the Olympics every four years. And when talking about breaking records, what did the poet say he would never do? And it says up there, um, where did we go? But never take drugs. So he'd never take drugs. And to finish us off now on the last page, um, please remember to go back and double check your answer off from the poem. Don't just think you know, just make sure that you've got the answer pinpointed in the poem. So according to the poet, what happens at the start of the Olympics? It says, the torch is lit. And what would make this poet very sore? It said that was training. At the end of the training, he'd be sore. What word in the second verse means the same as a remarkable or a skillful action? And that is the word feet. And it's not the same as the two feet at the end of your legs. This is spelt differently. And it's just an amazing accomplishment. Why would the poet cry in the third verse? And it tells us because he had won. That would make him cry if he'd won the medal. Okay, now the suffixes, ants and ents, and we had these in a previous test. Suffixes are... Um, word group, they're letter groups, sounds that come at the end of a word. So we have to put the correct suffix on the end of these words, ants or ants. The trapeze artist lost his balance, not balance. You might say balance, but it's balance. The judge asked for clear evidence, E N C E. The examiner admired the now eloquence. Eloquence, that's a big word and I'm sure you don't know maybe what it means or you've probably never used it but just to, it's to speak clearly so that everybody understands what you're saying with eloquence. And my mother cleaned the greasy substance off the cooker and that would be substance. And again there's a mark for each of those. Complete each of the following sentences by inserting in the blank spaces the past tense of the verb. Now the tense of verbs comes up a lot in uh, transfer work. So again, if you need more practice, go back to your PMP books, your uh, English PMP books, and there'll be a good section on verb tenses. Uh, also, just look them up. There'll be loads of things online if you want things to practice or if you don't understand what they are. But the past tense tells you what happened back in the past. So we have to change the ending usually on a verb to make it into the past tense. So the word is lie, that's the present tense. You lie in your bed, you will lie in your bed, but if it's going in the past, think about yesterday, I lay in bed. Sometimes when you do the past tense, you add a suffix, maybe ed, other times the word changes completely, the verb will change to the spelling changes completely. Lie becomes lay. The bells in the church tower wear uh, something for the coronation and the verb is ring. So you're thinking yesterday, think about the, ver the bells in that church tower yesterday were rung. And the word is deal. The teacher dealt very capably with all the difficult questions he was asked and dealt. Now, these, uh, the spelling is uh, vital. These are spelling questions. So if you're one word out or if you leave a letter out, if you leave a letter out, it'll all be marked wrong. And Jane laid the table for tea. So she laid the table for tea yesterday. And that's all of that test. So hopefully you're getting better, getting a wee bit quicker. Don't worry, when we get back to school, 
uh, next term when you're in P7 we'll be able to do lots and lots of practice and get all the little difficulties ironed out for you. Good luck with that one.